literally my minions. That's great.
Yeah, man. Chords and twos. Right. That's that's a George Garzon composition based on, well, actually, the melody is kind of George's melody, but then we play over origin changes. Oh, and right. Origin right. changes. I thought I recognized that. Yeah, yeah. Musicians yeah. that know tunes and usually recognize the progression, you know. Yeah. yeah. And they go nuts, you know. Very entertaining to the audience. <laughs> Probably a lot of sax players in the audience. <laughs> Probably a few. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is my guest Bruce Gertz, and uh, we've known each other over a f over a few years. <laughs> a while, but um, you can make it decades if you want. Yeah, I don't even remember if we pl ever played together. Did we? I think we did once with um, Bevan, probably. Bevan. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, were you in that band? Yeah, at the at Scullers when I Scullers. came down. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What year? What, what year was that? Eighties, hmm. early nineties, something like that. It was a long yes. time. I think that was my first <clears throat> concert back in Boston after I had moved to L.A. Okay, yeah. 
I remember I met Bevan through Tony Ballard. Oh yeah. And uh, and as soon as I met Bevan, it was friends at first sight. You know, yeah. he, he had written a song called "Looking for Bill," and that had it was not only written in my key, which is extremely rare. Um, <laughs> And but it had all these beautiful intervals, you know that I like. I like intervals, and uh, and <laughs> Bevan and I have recorded several things together, and you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's great. He's great. So creative. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. Totally great. Um, you already have a few a few guests who are saying how great it is. I'll just say hello, you know, from them. Hi, Mary Bogue. Mary Bogue is a great singer here. Frederica Palacci. Hi, Frederica. Oh. And <clears throat> Daryl Winsman. Do you know him? I don't think so. He loves he loves the Garzon thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> George is very popular. Yeah. Oh, hi, Michael Dolphin. Cool. And my friend Dan Davila. He put up your credits on all music, which sometimes, even though it's not 100%, it's kind of cool to look through. So we'll look through that in a little while. But um, mm -hmm. wanted to know who who everybody was, you know, as far as um, the players. Why don't you actually tell us who the players on that, are? On, well, on that particular group, um, on the right, we had George Garzon. Yep. And next to him was Jerry Bergonzi, two yep. of the great tenor players of our day. Fantastic. Um, um, on the left side, Gabriel Guerrero on piano. Wonderful. And, um, from Colombia, <clears throat> and he lives in New York. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, he and I have done a number of things together. He's on quite a few of my albums, actually. Oh, he's really some of his some of his tunes too. He writes really nice stuff. Huh. Um, and um, the drummer is Luther Gray. Uh, he plays in a lot of bands here in Boston. He's from D.C., though. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we did an album together called Anybody Home uh -huh. with a question mark. <laughs> it was during the time of uh, Obama's presidency uh -huh. when the House of Representatives was completely, you know, <laughs> not with the president. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So that was that was That's why I said anybody home? <laughs> anybody home? <laughs> pretty funny. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and it's funny because I wrote a tune based on uh, "You'd Be So Nice to Come Home To," <laughs> called "Anybody Home." Oh, <laughs> the, title, the title track of that album. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. A, a lot of my songs are based on standard changes. Yeah. So uh, we did that album, and then that was our CD release uh, party at the Lily Pad in Cambridge, and uh, we had a packed house and. You know, all the sax players and you know the players and drummers. And there were probably a few bass players there. I just, you know, they're, they're always working, so you know, <laughs> you don't see too many of them at gigs. You know, when yeah. You're there. I used to, I used to joke. Well, not kind of joke, not really. But <laughs> the bass player. You know, I had a jam session for like. 16 years and the first seven years were very intense with a lot of instrumentalists but the bass player man no bass players would come and sit you know sit in so the bass player had to do the whole night and you know kind of got grumpy after a while you know <laughs> I, can, I can understand i can relate to that you know i mean you feel like after a while you're kind of being abused yeah <laughs> you know when you've had to back up everyone and you yeah know, yeah, they they just get up and do their thing for a minute, for five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> At least in those days, uh, it wasn't. I mean, there were a lot of singers, but not you know, not like it wasn't a singer jam. Which oh yeah, later on my jams kind of became the singer jam, and I finally oh. quit because I just I, I couldn't take it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, like yeah. a mixture. You know, right. but um, you know, it's hard to get that going. So. <laughs> Well, I was telling students how when I was uh, a student myself at Berkeley, I used to go and play at Wally's, this famous place on Mass Ave, like one of the oldest jazz clubs around that yeah, area, yeah. Berkeley. Right, right. And uh, I would have to play thousands of choruses of Giant Steps while there were like nine horn players waiting to sit in one at a time, play five <laughs> minutes each. You know, that's how I built up my calluses. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah man. I, I, I feel for you. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> I do, seriously. <laughs> yeah. There's yeah. some uh, great bass players um, in town now. Oh, I'm yeah. telling you, man, just, uh, you know, shockingly great. There's a young yeah. guy who I saw last week, uh, Josh Crumley. Uh-huh. He, he also spends time in New York. He's, uh, and he took from, you know, some of the best, like he took from Ron Carter and he took, oh, yeah. from, can't remember. Who, anyway, what a beautiful player, ex extremely thoughtful. Like mm. when he's playing, you really get the sense he's loving the notes, you know, it's really, yeah. it's really beautiful. And he's, he's brave enough to do his own material, which is unusual and uh, kind of sensitive material. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, who else did I see? I saw, um, let's see, I've been seeing I, the, uh, just the music. I always say we have an embarrassment of riches here. We really do. There's so much, so many great musicians. Oh, I know. I was at Just Jazz. Oh, God, that bass player. He was, um, you probably know him. Oh, I wrote it down somewhere, but it's not around me. But wow, shit. Mm. Uh, you know yeah. Dana Stevens? Dana Stevens? Sax player. Sounds familiar. I don't know if I've ever played. I don't think I've ever played him. He's really good. You, yeah, that's another guy you would like to check out. Dana okay. Stevens. He's kind of, I, boy, I got like, without him actually copying Coltrane, I got this Coltrane vibe from him. You know, he's, yeah. he's put in a lot of, a lot of work mm -hmm. and he's good, a good soul and a courageous, you know, anyway, the bass player with him was, really incredible i'll have to look for that and send it yeah, to you. you can send it to me sure yeah, yeah. or dan, dan if you're listening tell me who the bass player was uh because that he was really good <laughs> daryl you're really filling up the comments hi <laughs> well I, let's see it looks like daryl is maybe a sax player yeah daryl's a sax player mm -hmm. um yeah so he's he's uh he's talking he wants he's collecting all your albums Oh, okay. Well, there's a lot of sax players on those albums. <laughs> I don't think Scholars is still open, right? Actually, it is. Oh. And I was supposed to play there January 21st with uh, with as with this with my group of my recent CD from 2020 with uh, Walter Smith, Smitty Smith, Lawrence Fields. <clears throat> uh, but then something a uh, Walter got a conflict. I got, so I got George Garzon and Phil Grenadier. Uh, I was still set to do it. And then the COVID thing started picking up and they stopped having they, this clubs closed for about a, six weeks. And then they yeah. just, they just opened up again at, at Valentine's day. Right. Right. Um, and now it looks like they offered me another date in February, which, uh, the other guys couldn't make. And I thought, you know, February's risky too because you could get a snowstorm or any kind <laughs> of happen. Plus, people are still afraid of COVID and they won't come out. So now we're looking at June and um, just waiting to get confirmation from the players. But uh, June, June what? Seventeenth. But it isn't confirmed yet. You know. I might. I'm. I. I might be in Boston if I'm in Boston. You I'm going to be there because okay. I have a gig actually at. Uh, the Deerhead Inn on the 19th. Sure. Um, I, I have a great band. I, I'm so excited. I'm coming east, you know. I think I yes. told you that. And I I didn't, it feels really different now. I I didn't plan this trip to do gigs. It was, I just planned this trip. Well, part of it was my high school reunion. And I just wanted to play with people I love and, you know. Sure. Continue the. So at the Deerhead, I have Mark Copeland, Drew Gress, and uh, Mike Steffens. Fantastic. Yeah. And then I have a gig at the Soapbox in the beginning of the trip, and that's with uh, Jim Riddle and Dean Johnson and Tim Horner. Oh, those are my buddies there. Tim and Dean. Great, guys. Great I player. Know. Everybody well, got it. Very well. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. But I was thinking, if I if if there's music happening, I let's hang out and go hear some good music. 
Okay. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> Smitty is supposed to play if, if it happens. If the gig happens, Smitty Smith is going to oh, play. Oh, on June. Yeah. Well, I'm excited about that. I That's love great, that. man. Yeah. Great. We we met um, playing with John Hendricks oh. back in the uh, early '80s. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, you might have met before that, but we we did that together. So, are you from Boston? No, I'm from Rhode Island. Oh, that's your accent is like there's something a little different, and that's the Rhode yeah, Island. Yeah, yeah. I was born in Providence and grew up in Cranston, Rhode Island. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So then it was just kind of a short hop over to Berkeley. Did right. I actually went to college first in New Hampshire, New England College for geology, but I only stayed one year. Oh. Yeah, I didn't really want to take geology, but parents didn't really think music was going to be lucrative. Why did they think <laughs> of geology? Well, they asked, I had to pick something, you know, <laughs> and I was, I was into that because I'd been collecting fossils and stuff when I was younger. <laughs> Who doesn't collect that stuff? I you? know, I know. It's That's crazy. Really funny. <laughs> yeah, and the joke is always like, well, I decided I was more into jazz than rock, you know. <laughs> well, that's why I didn't stick with geology, right? <laughs> were you were you playing bass like from as a kid? I started at fourteen. Yeah. Yeah, playing rock and blues. Yeah. Yeah. When'd you get into jazz? When we started having horn players in the blues band. <laughs> and um, <laughs> the horn player that we got, this young guy, he was like a year and a half younger than than us. He was only like 13 or something. And he was already into Charlie Parker and Coltrane. Oh, my and God. Owens and everybody. So he, he said I had to check those guys out and listen to Paul Chambers and Ron Carter and, you know, Ray Brown. Wow. And all the greats. And, I, and so <laughs> I got hooked at that. I Someone gave me a Mingus record and totally blew my mind. I was like, was Mingus, 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 you know. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, you know, yeah, I remember yeah. when Mingus actually came to Berkeley. I was there. I'll bet we were, we were there at the same time. Were you in that class? Like the, uh, it was. was the Hal, ha, I think it was the Hal, what's his name? Oh, Hal yeah. 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 I was. Melody and Improvisation. You know, that actually ruined me because he, he was such a freaking uh, monotone speaker. Oh, yeah, he was. And I didn't have the basics of theory and listening yeah. to him. Yeah. Hard to, <laughs> hard to be interested. Funny thing. He was, he's, he was the brother of Steve Grossman. Oh yeah. Famous tenor player. With now, all the I, and, I've talked to a lot of people who really admired Hal. you know? Yeah. Oh, he was a good teacher. I had him for an ensemble too. He was a very good teacher. Yeah. He left Berkeley and went into real estate. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. In <laughs> yeah. The yeah. I remember Mingus, though, because Mingus really, it was like, you knew, even though you didn't, even though I'll speak for myself, even though I didn't know a huge amount, because I was something like 18 or something, mm -hmm. I uh, I still knew that it was heavy. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. It was like, right. Wow, this guy is cool. And yeah, I went to. I was nineteen. I went to the um, jazz workshop to see him. He was in town doing the jazz workshop at the time. Yeah. So it was that. It's my dog ringing the bell to go out. <laughs> oh. His name is Mingus, by the way. Oh. <laughs> wow. He's a standard poodle. Oh. <laughs> yeah. He's big. He's a big, big dog. Anyway, uh, I went to the jazz workshop. Uh -huh. I went early to get a good seat. And there was nobody in the place but Mingus sitting at the bar. He was sitting there and there was a, he was talking to the bartender. And I went in there and I went up to him and I said, excuse me, uh, Charlie, Charlie Mingus. You know, I was very shy. You know, I didn't, I, would, I didn't know what to say to him. He says, yes. <laughs> I told him he was my hero and I, you know, I was a bass player and all that stuff. <laughs> he was so nice. said, have a seat, you know, have, have a beer or something, you know, I forget. Oh. What he Got to talk to him for a couple of minutes. It was really nice. Wow. It was very nice. I mean, I'd heard such scary things about him, you know, and that uh, he must have been in a mellow mood at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he probably were so sweet too. He probably just thought, 
you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I had a lot of a hair. Nice, respectful kid coming yeah, in. I had, I had a big head of hair, too, at the time. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. No, I, I don't, it's funny. I don't remember the jazz workshop even having a bar. The only mm-hmm. thing in my memory is the seating and the stage. Right. They had a bar in there, too? Yeah. Oh. It was, uh, it was actually kind of central towards the rear. Yeah. And uh, you could sit at it. Oh. You know, most people sat at tables, uh, you know, yeah. the, around it and in the front. Yeah. Yeah. That's so funny. I, I remember Paul's Mall having a bar, but that yep. was a lot bigger room. I, I bigger saw room. Um, the Jazz Workshop. Actually, I saw my first choice of going out to hear jazz. You know, not my dad's choice, but mine, uh, which was the Modern Jazz Quartet. Yeah. And my sister and I sat in the front row and and I had I had a high moment, you know. Yeah. Um they were, you know, the music was so high level and beautiful and the, and they were so uh they carried this, this such a beautiful persona, you know. They, they did. really affected me very deeply. Yeah. yeah, they were a very elegant group. Yeah, you know, like elegant. Yeah. Classy, you know, all wearing suits and tuxedos, whatever. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and they played so precisely and and yeah. with such nice dynamics and everything. Beautiful. I love that group. Yeah. Yeah. It was a beautiful, beautiful sound. Yeah. <clears throat> so. Yeah. So then, uh, let's see. I know. Um, you know, I don't want to skip over all the years. But um, I do know you started getting into, I mean, okay, here's my impression of you. <laughs> so you were a working bass player, and then you started, or not, you didn't start, you were probably peppered in along the way of artistic stuff, start composing and playing with, you know, more modern uh, players for uh, a more modern express expression. Mm-hmm. And um, I know you wrote several books. And um, so, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of richness to pick from in there. But yeah. um, when did you, I mean, that you, you're shaking your head. So that's kind of a, a I guess, an accurate kind of. Well, a, it's a general, uh, there's some accuracy in that in a general yeah. way. I yeah. actually majored in arranging composition at Berkeley. Yeah. Yeah. So that was that were that was a big part of my studies in addition to bass. Yeah. You know. Um, yes, I I studied uh, traditional composition uh, and jazz composition. You know, I went to, I had Herb Pomeroy's uh, line writing class at this and similarly at the same time had John Bavicki's 12 tone writing class. Oh, yeah. <laughs> serial okay. composition and yeah. um, <clears throat> yeah. And uh, I also took uh, advanced harmony and Paul with uh, Paul Schmeling and modal writing with uh, Ray Santisi and uh, film scoring with uh, what's that guy's name? Oh, I can't think of his name. Ray Santisi. <laughs> oh yeah, Ray. Yeah, he was the, the he was the piano player that all the bass players would talk about because he played too much left hand and kept reharmonizing the song every chorus. <laughs> you know, you'd have to do cat and mouse, you know, with his left hand if you wanted to play with him, you know. <laughs> well, he couldn't just play chords. He had to like play bass lines and they were always like every chorus different. So you'd, oh, think, wow. you'd think you had it, you know, after the, and he'd change it up. Interesting. Was he, do you think he was doing it just for his own taste or was he doing it to kind of mess around? With you? Oh, he, he had spent a lot of years playing solo piano gigs. Oh, okay, yeah. And I think that was what happened, and he couldn't get out of it. He couldn't yeah. stop doing it. It was like a really bad habit that he had developed. Ah, because he used to, he used to be, be be great at comping, you know. And when he when he played in Herb Pomeroy's big band, and John Nevs was the bass player, who was my teacher, uh, he never got in the way there. You know, he mm. just took care of business. You know. Interesting. Yeah. 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 And when he taught the modal class he, he just comped beautiful voicings and played these great lines and it was great and uh then later he got those solo gigs for quite a while you know and uh <laughs> oh man yeah, the, good, you the good and the bad man 
talk to any bass player in Boston and mention him and they would go, Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so, but anyway, um, Oh, Bevan so Manson is here, by the way. Bevan. Bevan. Hey, hi. Bevan. We love talked you, about you. <laughs> yeah, I miss playing with Bevan. I love playing with Bevan. Yeah. We did a lot of gigs together. Yeah. When he was here. Yeah. Uh, but um, so I did the composition thing, and I got into it then, and I started writing stuff. And so I actually, at this point, I don't, I don't look back at too many of the really old things. But one thing recently was a collaboration with a bass player that I met through the International Society of Bassists named Klaus Freudenstein, uh, a German bassist, very good classical musician. He teaches little kids and they have these things called mini basses. They oh. come in all colors, like there's one the color of your top. Oh, wow. And uh, there's, there's bright green and all these beautiful colors and kids bow them. You know, they sound great. So wow. anyway, I, I became friends with Klaus because we served on the board of the International Society of Bassists together. And in recent times, we had a meeting with other people who had been on the board. And uh, we are now the advisory board. And we decided to collaborate. So he liked one of my old pieces called Snowfall that I wrote during the blizzard of 78 in Boston. And it was a bass, it was written for three basses, drums, percussion, piano, and saxophone. So what we did was we reduced it to, let's see, I had three electric basses that I overdubbed here. And he had, I don't know how many upright basses that he overdubbed in Germany. Ah. It's out now. It's on YouTube. Oh, really? It's, on, it's also on Deezer, uh, Spotify. The name of it again? Snowfall. And is is that what we would find it? We maybe yeah. we'll go listen yeah, to it. If you look at yeah, it's pretty. Snowfall um Klaus Freudenstein. Let's let's just see if I can find it. But go picture, ahead. There's a nice little picture of, you know, some one artist of a friend of his drew a nice picture and <clears throat> there's a he's playing acoustic and I played electric bass on it. And I did How do you spell his last name? Freud and... F R E U D E N. Oh, I think I got it. E I N. Yeah. Yeah. This. Um, do you mind if we watch a little? No, go ahead. It's just. It's probably a short thing anyway. Oh yeah, it's like fifteen. Uh, oh, it must be the trailer then. If it's just. Oh, this okay. Let's. let's okay, see. watch the trailer. I mean. <laughs> I mean, I, we, I, I can watch that, or let's see. Maybe I can go back to. Is it this? There one? it is. It's that one. Yeah. That's actually kind of a, um, that's a uh, PR for it. Yeah, that right? that's yeah. what that is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, cool. a, yeah that's That was in 1978, and I, I was um, inspired by the modal writing class, I guess, because it was all uh, like a D. Lydian sound. Uh. <laughs> yeah, except for the bridge, the, the bridge section. So, but I've got, now I've got over 260 songs uh, published and registered with ASCAP. Wow. And um, I'll, I'd say 95% of them are on my CDs and stuff. Wow, yeah. that's a lot. I, I know that's a lot. I have yeah. probably 60, 60 songs, I guess, myself. But I try and put at least one on every CD. But yeah. 260 is a lot. Right. Well, I've done CDs that have just my 
on music, many of them. And so with 20 under my name, and some of my tunes are on other people's records, like Mick Goodrick's records and Jeremy oh. records, and um, who else? Well, for, can I be excused to let my dog in for a second? Sure. <laughs> <Be right back. laughs> I'd like to see the dog. <laughs> sounds sounds like a good dog. Oh, thanks, thanks, Dan. Yeah. Stay right there. Stay right there. Come here. Okay, missed it. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. He's here gone. and gone. Yeah. By the way, stay on that track, but I just wanted to say my friend told me who was in that band that I was telling you about. And uh the bassist who I, I'm not sure if he's in LA or New York, Rick Rosado. Rick Rosado. I know the name, but I don't I can't place a place. He's a young young player and pff, Oh yeah, another monster. I see. I see these young monsters all the time. You know, I find Berkeley gig. You know, where I've been teaching for forty-five years now. Yeah. Jeez. Oh, I've I've seen a lot of monster bass players come through there. Yeah. Um, you know, some of my uh, former students are pretty well known, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like Reuben Rogers. I don't know him, Reuben. Well, he's Rogers. in New York. He's in New York, and mm -hmm. uh, Matt Penman. Do you know Matt? No. New York. Um, <clears throat> well, you've heard of Victor Bailey, right? <laughs> yeah. He passed away, but he, he was my student, too. Victor and was? Victor was, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. And Stuart Ham. Uh-huh. Um, Elaine Carone. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jeff Andrews also passed away. He was my student. Um, yeah, a lot of... A lot of oh, uh, Kaya Kart. Who? Kaya Kart. He's a German. He was. He's from Germany. Huh. I don't know. Kaya Kart. Oh. I think okay. it's E C K H A R D T. Um, and uh, Schoolies Ferrison, an Icelandic bass player. Wow. Played, played with Alan Holsworth and a lot of other people, and he's a great bass player. Um, wow. Yeah. And oh, and Esperanza Spalding and Math Matthew Garrison. Jimmy oh. son. Yeah. Huh. Well, everybody has to be a student sometime, you know. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all—all all those people are all fantastic bass players. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's really—it's great to see and hear. It really is great. And um, yeah, we we had a club, the Blue Whale, here for um, yeah. ten, over ten years, and that housed uh everybody you know everybody came through and wanted to play at the blue whale it was really a really a great club yeah and uh, so, the pandemic yeah oh yeah he held on to it for a, about a year after, oh. when the pandemic started but then it was in a building that was super expensive i don't know i don't know exactly what happened as far as uh the landlord charging him or you know there was nothing going on so mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah but yeah. Um, oh, Bevan says, um, Bevan says uh, that he's going to be in Boston during the summer. Oh, good. That's nice. Yeah. Does, he know, does he know like approximately when? Or? Bevan. <laughs> anyway, there's yeah. a little delay on this. So that's OK. That's OK. I probably still have his contact. I can. Get I can. I can actually send it to you because I think he has, in the last few years, changed it. Maybe. Maybe okay. it's been more than a few years. But anyway, I'll. I'll send it to you. I'm going to write myself a note. Send Bev's or Bev. You can just at message Bruce too. Yeah. Um. So anyway. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That's great. Um, oh, he said prob probably July. Oh, July. Okay. Yeah, and he he actually <laughs> he left his email, which I can put in the chat for you. Okay, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds See? good. Yeah, there it is. Yep. Okay, I'm going to copy it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, so then uh, you've been teaching there for. Did you say 45 years? So yep. that's 
Uh, let's see. So I've lived out here for just about that. So you must have started like right after school. I did. I started actually in my senior year. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, um, I had a roommate, uh, Neil Olmsted, pianist. And Neil was uh, in the process of getting a master's degree at New England Conservatory. Uh, and he got, to, he got a job teaching at Berkeley. And he had just graduated from Berkeley undergraduate. And so I thought, maybe I should try that too, you know. And uh, I talked to Rich Appleman, who was the chair of the bass department. And the, the department was starting to grow. And they needed people anyway. And I knew the system. So he said, yeah, why don't you have start out with a couple of labs, you know. And then I, so I did a couple of labs. I had one lab with 13 upright bases in it. Unbelievable. And, <laughs> and I, I also managed to get a couple of ensembles that I could teach too. So I did that for one semester, and then um, I came back. Uh, it was either the summer or the fall, and I happened to run into Rich Appleman again, and he he said he could use me in the department, and that was I got hired, and boom, full time the whole time now. Wow! Yeah, that's great. It is great. Yeah. I didn't exactly know how the best way how to teach. I just kind of copied what my teachers did. And I guess that's what they do. Anyway, so. And then and then I, I developed, you know, more of my own things, you know, from my writing and my other. Yeah. Uh, creative. How areas. many books have you written? Uh, six. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, I, I have two that I published myself. One's on walking bass called walking. That's that's probably sold the most because it's been out so long since '79, oh. and then um, the next one was 22 Contemporary Melodic Studies, which was all like solo stuff, and then I did two books for Mel Bay called Mastering the Bass, Volume One and Two, and then I did a, a book called Let's Play Rhythm for Advanced Music of Germany, uh, which I had a lot of other people play on, like Bergonzi and. Um, see who else played on that. Uh, Jeff Galindo, trombone player, Matt Marvulio, flute player, and Ken Cervanka, trumpet player. And I did rhythm tracks with uh, Bob Kaufman and Russell Hoffman. Russell plays piano, Bob plays drums. So, and that, that came out real nice. There's three CDs. One's like a complete album with all the solos and everything intact. Then there's one with just the melodies, and then you can do your own solos after you play the bass part. And then there's just the rhythm section. So if you wanted to, if you're a, an instrumentalist or a vocalist, you want to just practice with it, you know? And cool. it's a pretty good sized book. Um, it's basically variations on rhythm changes, all keys, different reharmonizations, sections that are opened up. So there's yeah. pedals and stuff and uh, different grooves, you know? Uh -huh. Latin, funk, swing. Yeah, it's really nice. Um, I use it in an advanced improv class at school. Yeah. Yeah. And then my, the most recent book was a collaboration with uh, Rich Appleman, the former chair of the bass department, and Whit Brown, you know, the bass professor. Mm -hmm. uh, he, re he, he recently retired, but we, we got together and we did a book, three of us. Oh, called really? Berkeley, cool. Yeah, Berkeley Jazz Bass. Yeah, and that's published by Hal Leonard. Yeah. Your fan here, Daryl Winsman, also purchased many of them for teaching and practicing. <laughs> oh, very nice. Thank you. I hope you have fun with them. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I have to yeah. practice them myself to keep it up. I have to keep, when I pull them out, and like if I show a student something, I have to actually be able to play it myself, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's good to be able to show the student how to do something. <laughs> totally. like yeah. be able to do what you're teaching yeah i have that i have that too um yeah. i've i've actually been taking a piano class too which is um it's interesting because over the years i mean i still play flute which is what i played at berkeley yeah. um and but i don't really play it i did take a lesson during the pandemic and actually i still have my embouchure and you know, it it would be realistic to practice and to actually get get it together. For some reason, I'm not 
super drawn to it and my time is so filled yeah. you know that it just but the piano somehow is different i you know because uh i i'd like to be better at the piano i play you know i play chords in my right hand and i can play time and transpose and all that but this is this is real piano where you play chords in your left hand and you comp and then you play a melody <laughs> all together and it's it's challenging but i actually um i've i actually uh and i've only been in the class a month and a half i guess but i can actually see something changing which is um exciting and also i mean realistically i'm not gonna you know i'm not gonna become a genius piano player just really because i don't have the time to put in on it because that's what you need to really yeah. become seriously yeah. good yeah. but be, just yeah. uh yeah. in general you know i did a gig yesterday and i just see what's whatever is going on i'm also reading kenny warner's second book and you know just uh, isn't it good becoming the instrument yeah, yeah, I really like the book. Excellent book. Yeah. Yeah, I like it a lot. I like his first but, book. Um, oh yeah, but <laughs> so let's see. About two talk, days oh, ago, I was looking. At, yeah, but like two days ago, I was looking at my piano class assignment, and like his assignments basically went from here to here, and I literally I. I had kind of a panic attack. <laughs> you know, I was like, what? I, I, there's no way I can practice all that, you know? Then, wouldn't you know it, I opened Kenny's book, and it's it's the section that has like 10 points on patience. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah. it said in there, you don't have to practice everything all at once. You just, just practice one thing. And yeah. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Right. So it's really important, anybody listening, just like in, enjoy everything that's out there in this moment. You know, like if it's a book, read some, you know, just like if it's a, it's a, a YouTube video of Eckhart Tolle, just go for it. You know what I mean? Listen to music. I mean, now, actually, now I'm really, I, <laughs> I am listening to piano players more, you know, like like your thing, the, the first thing that we played. I was noticing how Gabrielle, Gabrielle? Yeah, Gabrielle, yeah. Yeah, comps, you know, really kind of simply and uh, and really, but really there, you know, really beautiful. Yes. One thing that he does that blows my mind is improvising yeah. with two hands. Unison. Yeah, I saw that, yeah. You know, he, he can play like so amazing stuff, you know, doing that with both hands. Yeah. It's hard. It is. I mean, I, I'm lucky if I can, you know, <laughs> do just a little simple, like a scale <laughs> of hands, you know. But I, I play the piano every day I, as, I'm, as a composer. Oh. I go there every morning, and I, you know. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. But I, <laughs> I can put the pedal down and play a voicing and just sit there and listen to that voicing for a long time. Yeah. You know. That too. I, I, um, like my class, he gave us this, what he calls drone exercises. And that, that was like the first thing that we had to do. Uh, cause this is a kind, kind of a beginning class, although you have to have some knowledge. C and G in the left hand, and then just improvise over C. And then, mm -hmm. you know, reading Kenny's book reminded me like, play one note and just hear how it all sounds. You know, don't be afraid. You don't have to rush on or, I mean, you can experiment, but listen to the, listen, you know, to one thing, you know? Yes. yes. Yeah. I think, um, you know who Charlie Binakis was, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I remember hearing a story from, I guess, Jerry, that Charlie's parents, you know, were, he was driving them crazy because he just played the same note for 14 hours. Wow. One, the same note on the piano. I guess he was just trying to get the touch to be exactly what he wanted to be. And, was he learn. a student of Madame Shaloff? He was. Because that's what she See, she was into that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, Serge Sharloff was a great saxophone player, yeah. really in the jazz scene, recording Parent. scene. And his mother, 
Madam Sharloff was a famous teacher in Boston. And I, I've heard lots of different stories about people mm -hmm. going to her and playing one note. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. Chick went to her. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Possibly Keith Jarrett as well. But uh, Jerry Carl Schroeder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and then the other thing that's cool that Kenny talks about. <laughs> is, I mean, a lot of people talk about this. I don't. <coughs> I wonder if you t if you teach like this, play. Well, um, play play something small, and and listen and play it again, and listen. It's kind of like the one note thing. Mm -hmm. But, um, and what like if you're working on something small. And you get you get a mastery over it, it will affect all the rest of your playing. Yes, absolutely. So I like that. Mm hmm. You know, you can play, and I, I tell my students all the time. You know, now you have all these kids that can just play so much <laughs> stuff. You know, they just and they and they can't not play all that stuff. So they they. Yeah. You know, bass guitar or whatever, and they just they see these kids on YouTube or young people on YouTube and just ripping the neck up, you know, shredding it, and that's what they want to do, you know. But then when it comes down to like just putting down the a beautiful tone on one note in a ballad or something as a bass player, that's a very big challenge for them. Or having the discipline to not play too many notes as an accompanist. So, you know, I, my old teacher, John Nez, when I listened to a recording of him with, I think it was Maynard Ferguson, big band, and I heard the beauty of just one note that he played, and I thought, oh, my God, I waited for the next one, and it was <laughs> even better, you know, and it was just like such a, oh, you know, that's the kind of thing that, you know, people don't always get that quality. And, uh, I know. You know? Yeah, it's uh, it. It also has to do with, I think, uh, comfortableness of just being in the moment, you know, yeah. um, and enjoying what is going on, you know, right. right? And and actually, that's of course the best way that you personally can come out as an artist, yeah. which is another, you know, of course, thing that we that we teach others and ourselves, you know, <laughs> Yeah, you know, in the mirror every day and remind ourselves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Charlie Hayden uh, on a Schofield record that, and something's some groovy tune, right? And Schofield takes a burning guitar solo and Charlie's next. And what does he do? He plays a whole note, you know, right. <laughs> it's right. like, it, all, it always kills me. It's like, that is so cool. It's so it serves the music so well, you know. He had one of the most beautiful sounds on bass, you know, just gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. I actually had a um, um, <clears throat> when I visited Joe Diorio last time or the time before, he gave me this cassette of a live performance of him and uh, Charlie and Billy Higgins. Ooh. <laughs> Oh, that must have been beautiful. Yeah. Wow. Really nice. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I'll, I'll send that to you. Great. Um, yeah, well, <clears throat> how about if we hear some more from you? Sure. Uh, you, you mentioned your record, your new record. Yeah. Yeah, running in the now background. Uh, can I? Do you want to play it, or shall I play it? Yeah, you play it. So it's on. Okay. Uh, it's called running in the background, and it's on. Uh, oh. <laughs> on it's YouTube. actually called running in the background. Okay. That's the name of the album. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I thought you were saying it was running in the background. <laughs> no. <laughs> 
Yeah, running in the background, Bruce Gertz. Oh, <laughs> wow. It's going to be a whole bunch to... of these things. You have to put my name in there, too. There it is. Uh, any particular song? You can play the title track if you want. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Before we... Uh, just tell us about this. I know it's okay. your... Um... It's the one I did during, like, in 1920, uh, 1919 uh, in the summer. And um, it's got Walter Smith III on tenor, Lawrence Fields on piano, Vic Juris, I think it may be his last recording before he passed away, and Marvin Smitty Smith on drums. And it was recorded in New York at another great student of mine's studio, which happens to be a very popular studio. His name is Scott Petito. The name of his studio is NRS. And uh, Dave Holland, Jack DeJanet play there a lot. Uh, Schofield did a, re a, a several records there. Chick's been in. Everybody's been in this place. <laughs> um, oh. Yeah, he's up in uh, Catskill, New York. You know, and uh, a lot of players like Jack and Dave live in that area. Uh huh. Yeah. So anyway, it was, it was a really nice experience. Um, two days in that studio, and then when I came back, I wanted to come back to mix it, and then when the COVID hit. You know, and um, so I didn't get to go back until the following August, um, a year later. Oh, yeah. 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 And uh, and finally got to mix it. And then so it came out in 2020. Yeah. Cool. And well, is, uh, yeah, the first song is called Running in the Background and it. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. That's good. OK. And for uh, your, this cover is really beautiful, I have to well, say. Thank you. That was uh, an artist named uh, Mark Welcome. He does great beautiful. cover art. Yeah. Very nice. And what's the history of the, the title running in the background? OK. Well, <clears throat> my, uh, my wife was complaining about complaining about the um, her phone being super slow and, you know, all this and the battery going down and all this stuff. And my daughter said, hey, you know, you you got to close out the apps. You know, they're all running in the background, you know, <laughs> right. And so yeah. then I I just gave that some thought and I and I realized, like, everything's running in the background, like the world <laughs> is running in the background, you know, everything is going on at once. You know, in your mind, too, you know, when you're doing something, there's something in the back of your mind going on. Uh, while we're talking now, you know, uh, well, who knows what's going, you know, everything's happening everywhere else. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, the planets are <laughs> rotating around us and around the sun, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, so that was a really great um, revelation for me. <laughs> okay, that's good. I like yeah. that. Yeah. All right, here it is running in the background. <laughs>
Wow, beautiful. <clears throat> Sounds Thank great. You. Thank you. Wow. I love Walter. He's, you know, he lived out here for a while. Yeah. He's working. Yeah. Plays great. Everybody sounds great and interesting. The mix is really good. And it's actually the bass and guitar kind of, you know, a little bit out front, in, at least in my sound system. Is uh -huh. that kind of how it was? Uh, well, yeah, because I think what happened there was Walter uh, was one of those moving targets in the studio, you know? <laughs> <laughs> He plays like, you know, he, he gets excited and he, he kind of dips down and moves away from the <laughs> mic. You know what I mean? Yeah. So he's, he's hard to like keep <laughs> in the front, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, as a result, I think that involved one of the piano mics. He was getting picked up in one of the piano mics as he would oh. go over there. Yeah. And then that, and that would sound, make it sound like a distant, I don't know, something weird was going on. So I think one of the mics had to be maybe either cut way back or whatever, and the other one boosted. I don't know. It was, it was kind of a strange thing. But it, yeah, the mix a, ended up coming thing, well, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah. But it sounded great, though. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, uh, I mean, your, your bass wasn't like over loud. It was just, it was, you don't normally hear the bass quite that forward in the mix and so right it's, yeah it's 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 a little different but it's really beautiful and the playing was gorgeous wow Thank you. yeah it's uh it's a very um interesting album there's a, a lot of different stuff on it you know yeah what uh, now what do you mean different well i mean the music the, the tunes are they they're very different from one another you know yeah how yeah. so well like different that one, feel. different feels, different vibes, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah. Like I, I, I had John Abercrombie in my group for 15 years and uh, oh. been in, <clears throat> back in the 90s uh -huh. um, and into the 2000, uh, until around 2005. And, um, you know, I couldn't do more than one or two gigs a year, actually, because he was so busy, and so were the other players that were in that group: Joey, Joey Calderazzo, Adam Nussbaum, and Jerry Berganzi. All busy guys, all like, well, except for Adam, you know, band leaders in their own right, you know. So, yeah. you know, but I managed to to keep together. So anyway, when John passed away, I wrote a song for for him uh, called "Song for Crumbles," uh -huh. and it's it's on that album. So, and it's just it's a waltz. And it's just so much more, you know, gentle than that song we just heard. You know, I think well, Smitty we'll and take Marshall a listen to that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't have to play the whole, obviously, the whole album here. But I mean, there's that, and yeah. then there's another, another song on there that's like a, an interesting, like, uh, very light Latin feel, called Cyber Hypnosis. <laughs> and uh, that's the one that se seems to be a favorite of people that have the album. Oh, yeah, cool. it's, it's interesting. It's also very um, not quite as as mild as the as the Abercrombie Waltz, but that that song has a vibe that you can just kind of space out to. Mm. <laughs> you ever have uh, people write lyrics to your songs? You know, I've been approached a couple of times, but but no one's come across with any lyrics. I would love it. You want to write some lyrics? I'll, I'll have to listen. I, I like, I enjoy writing lyrics. Yeah. Um, and I've written, well, actually I wrote uh, lyrics to Hippityville when I was in college, John's song, and I've recorded it several times. I even performed it yesterday and it, wow. um, it's great. It's a really, it's cool. And um, <clears throat> um, I also with, with, uh, with blessings and publishing, I wrote, uh, Lyrics to Pat Metheny's In Her Family. Do you know that song? No. It's from First Circle. And um, also with Blessings yeah, and Publishing, I wrote for uh, Vince Mendoza a song called um, Ambivalence, which is just beautiful. 
I also mm. wrote lyrics for this uh, Atmar Ruiz, which I was telling you about. One of my favorite, obviously one of his favorite songs too, because he records it and plays it at every gig. But it's, uh, it's just a great. I have. I'll have to share that with you too. Yes. <laughs> I'm writing down these notes to of what I want to share with you. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> um. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. I. Um. You know, if a song really strikes me, I. I. You know, I can definitely write some significant lyrics, I think, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, I'd like to, that you should listen to the rest of that record and see if there's anything that, you know, sparks yeah. some uh, well, inspiration for, for lyrics. It, I will. And if you think of it, if you think of like a, a sure. you know, one with a melody that you think might, that you, you might hear with a yeah. little bit of a second. Right. Yeah, let me know too, but I'll I'll definitely be listening to this record. It's gorgeous. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, very... Vic Juris too, man. I oh. the last time I was in New York, maybe the last time I was in New York, I went to the fifth bar fifty five, and <clears throat> yeah, I was list. Uh, my friend was playing organ with him. Uh, yeah. I forget his name. Gary Versace or nope. Larry um, Goldings? Nope. Uh, Dan Wall? <laughs> I'm trying to think all the all the organ players I know. No. Um, I forget his name. I shouldn't forget his okay. name. But anyway, um, and, and Vic was playing. And I was, that was the first time I'd heard about Vic. And I was so blown away because, like I said, he's he's like my kind of guitar player, you know. Yeah. And then actually, I happened to hang out with his wife and a few of my girlfriends, like Jay Clayton and um, Kate McGarry, and uh, so we hung out in their little New York apartment. Yeah. But um, yeah, wow, Vic was really great. Yeah. <clears throat> I want to say Brian. Uh, God, that is just... It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not okay. <laughs> it's not okay that my mind has a hole in it. No, Joyce, not Sam. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> I mean, it's it's fun. It's like the only good, th okay thing is that everybody else is having the same problem. So that's oh, yeah. Things. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> that's, that's uh, very common at this age, you know? <laughs> <clears throat> so do you do you feel like uh like you had along the way do you feel like you had any like artistic epiphanies <clears throat> um just curious you know like if there was some moments that you went oh wow okay you know this is the direction i want to go in or this is what i want to write or something <clears throat> I, I, I probably have had many of those, <laughs> you know, um, like whenever I study a certain area of uh, tonal science, if you will, like, for instance, um, the uh, Mercian uh, scales of limited transposition, stuff like that. Uh, there's a six note like a hexatonic scale and there's a nine note scale and there's these scales and in those scales are all these harmonies that you don't find in uh, diatonic typical diatonic harmony and but while studying those you know other things sort of come into focus when you when you see uh relationships in in these other things that you look at yeah it's, it's like, oh, you know, everything kind of falls in that space, you know? It's like, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. I don't know how to explain that, but uh, it's like when you go for a walk in the woods and you just look at, you know, the way plants grow. And, and, and my wife is, uh, she's into mycology, which is a mushroom study, the mm. study of mushrooms. And, uh, yeah. She actually, you know, uh, harvests, you know, but, yeah, what's the word? Uh, forages them during oh, yeah. season. 
Yeah. And we have a freezer. I had to buy a freezer to put all the mushrooms in. We yeah. enjoy it. We She studies and knows that which, which ones are safe and which ones are not. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, so we have a freezer full of like, really good mushrooms. Uh, but anyway, we, we saw a film called uh, Fabulous Fungi. <laughs> have you seen that? No, I haven't. Oh. Uh, or fantastic fungi. Well, it's a. It was only shown in spe special theaters for a while, but um, it explains how beneath the ground, yeah. every single everywhere you step, no matter where you are, you could be on a floor, or whatever, under the ground, there's at least three hundred feet of of um, veins of mushroom uh, mycelium. That connect yeah. all the trees and all the plants, and it's like the the arterial system of the earth. Oh, wow. Yes, it's like a vascular system of the earth, mushrooms. Oh. And you know like oh. how we have neurons in our brains, and you see the pictures yeah. of the neurons firing and stuff. <clears throat> That's what the network of this of this mycelium under the ground is like. Interesting, it, isn't that? And mushrooms are just like extensions of that that come up. When, when the conditions oh. are right. But under the ground is all this stuff that's moving through all the plants and everything. It's just, and so, you know, in harmony and melody, we have a similar kind of weaving, you know, where notes resolve and they connect and then they move off and then they connect and then they move off, you know? Yeah. Now, have you heard of, um, nice. uh, I forget what the disease is called, but, you know, Victor Wooten, who's now doing some teaching at Berkeley, um, had it, uh, dystonia or something. It's a thing where your brain misfires uh, neurologically, like a signal that's supposed to tell you to do a certain thing with your hand or whatever okay. misfires, and it just goes off and gets lost somewhere else in your brain, yeah. and you don't, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Yeah. So... I was looking up stuff like this and I came across this term called neuromodulation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That sounds interesting. Yeah. So you know how when you have harmony and you modulate, you know, and there's this, yes. there's a, there's, there are different types of modulation. There are ones that happen gradually in steps. And then there are mm -hmm. sudden modulations where all of a sudden, boom, you jump to another key that's quite a ways away from the one you started. Yeah. So <clears throat> I like that term a lot, um, and I I made a <clears throat> a solo bass recording. It's not out yet. I I have two other ones that are out, but this new one I I did all these twelve tone rows that I wrote, you know, um, and I have a series of of them called neuromodulation two and neuromodulation eight and neuromodulation twenty five and all this kind of stuff. So you know. Uh, I took these 12 tone melodies that I wrote and I improvised in the studio um, with them. Uh, I tried different things like reading them backwards, starting in different places, ending in different places, phrasing the rhythm differently, all this stuff. And I call them neuromodulations. So, I mean, I, that came from the whole concept of the mushroom thing and then the brain thing and the, the, uh, you know, firing of neurons and <laughs> it sounds crazy. But it sounds crazy, but you asked me uh, a simple question, and that's a complicated answer to it. But yeah. no, I like that. I yeah. I think that's great. I mean, I get what you're talking about. Yeah. Although yeah. theoretically, I'm not. I'm not there. However. I do hear what you're talking about. Um, right. And uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, especially, you know, coming from the <clears throat> the neuron mushroom idea. Actually, a person on here saw that film and they loved it. Isn't that amazing? Um, yeah, that's really interesting. And did you, did, you said you recorded that? Is it I did. I recorded it. I, I recorded some solo bass tracks, and and um, it's going to come out on a CD actually. 
Um, oh, okay. It's not out yet. Not out yet, but um, do I have screen sharing ability? I could play something for yeah. you if you want to hear something. Do? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, me, okay. I can I can play neuromodulation too because I'm sure it's on my computer. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Do I have to? Screen. Do I have to um, enable my? I think you're okay. I can. My audio will share too. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. You just you know when you go to the screen share and okay. hit, you know say share audio. Okay. Let's try. Okay. Let's see. <clears throat> my friend uh, posted. By the way, it was Brian Charette. Oh, it sounds familiar, but I don't think I know him. Yeah, and uh, so that's who I saw at Club Fifty Five, and my oh. friend posted, maybe that was the date. Actually, I don't know, Dan. Thanks for sharing that. Uh huh. Just go back here a little bit. No, oh, here we go. Neuromodulation two. Now you might have to share actually share the screen for us to hear it. Oh. Okay. Oh, I can hear it now actually. Is it playing? Yeah. Okay, good. Maybe take the volume down just a little so it, it won't. Okay. Uh, uh, oh, is that better? I think so. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let me. Maybe I should back it up from the beginning because you can hear the um. Hear the, the twelve tone row. Okay. <laughs>
It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it's it kind of. I don't know exactly theoretically what it's doing, but I it, I hear it center around this kind of note area where yeah, everything well that, else. There's is. that there's that little theme, you know. Yeah. That's yeah. the that's the row, the twelve tone row, and then what I try to do, I didn't always completely succeed, but I I always kept it musical. But I was trying to take parts of it. Because I, I didn't, you know, I didn't feel completely comfortable to just use that the whole time as it was. Yeah. So I would take sections of it and I would um, maybe you saw I would repeat maybe a few notes back and forth or things like that yeah. Yeah. Um, to use like more like a motivic, like what they call tropes, little small parts of the of the 12 tone row. Yeah. And uh, oh. Yeah, and of so course you, my my jazz improvisation would kick in every now and then, and I would kind of just go off, you know, do whatever my ear <laughs> took me to do. And so this recording is a number of these. Well, I did a whole CD of just a bunch of these kind of things, yeah. uh, but I'm actually putting together an album that's. Um, I, I always wanted to do like a ballad album. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm uh, collecting, I've spent many years at the same studio, and I have a huge backlog of material that's never come out. So I started going through and, and pulling out things that were mellow, you know, rather than high impact, um, and try to put a ballad album together. I have a title for it. It's called Gently Said. And um, so far, I've got like six tracks that I really like. And this is one of the tracks that's on there. Oh. And I'm going to because I want I needed some some bass solo time a little bit because I'm not really playing many solos on the on the the record at all. Not that I have to. I mean, I, some of my favorite albums have no bass solos on them. You know, yeah. albums with Ron Carter and stuff. You know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but <clears throat> um, I had these, and they're a nice departure from the full band sound. Yeah. You know, just a bass solo sound is kind. Of, even though it's it's a little bit modern and all that, it's it's sort of gentle. It doesn't really, you know, bother anybody. They hear a, a quiet bass solo in the background, you know, <laughs> not that I want it to be thought of as background music. Um, but, you know, on a, on a gentle CD, you know, a, a little bass solo like that is kind of nice. Yeah. 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 That's very yeah. nice. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. nice to, um, to I'm sorry I'm sorry I I'm, I'm remembering my gig yesterday which Oh yeah, it's okay. Was so nice. Great players. Yeah. Uh, my friends, you know, I've played with all of them. It's and, always so great to play with your friends. Yeah. And they all know where I'm coming from and they know, you know, they know my music, they know the music I'm working on, they know my sensibilities and it's just nice to as we were saying before be in the moment enjoy right. enjoy the moment be uh, dynamic you know um which they all were you know um and um and change up things you know from like changing the order of solos or who's soloing or and then changing the whole vibe the next song i mean it's just uh it's uh, it's always it always has your essence in it, which is uh, I think the cool thing about hearing people. You know, you're you're really hearing their essence, no matter what they're playing. It reminds me of a gig I once did, where um, you know we did a country song, and somebody came up right afterwards and said, "Could we hear a country song?" I was like, "Oh, okay, I get it." It's me doing a country song, you know. It kind of reminds people of country, but it's not. <laughs> exactly. It's not real country, you know. Yeah, yeah, interesting. But that's the nice thing about hearing artists, you know. You uh, the good artists who uh, really are in the moment and aren't pushing to do something that they think will be hip. You know, it's just exactly it's, uh, you actually hear what people are their perspective, you know? Yeah, I think it's, it comes down to like the sincerity of, of your music, you know, like how it's coming from your heart, you know, it's like, that's, that's really where it's coming from. It's not just from your head. 
Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You want the word the right... nowadays authentic. Yes. <laughs> I once uh, had a, a student from, um, I think he was from, yeah, he was from Czech Republic, and he reviewed one of my CDs. He was an older student. Like, he, he came to Berkeley. He was already in his 30s. A really, really fine, great bass player. Yeah. And he reviewed one of my early CDs, and he described it as the perfect balance between intellect and emotion. And I just thought that was a great thing to say, you know? That's lovely, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's really nice. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. I was looking for the all music thing, which we've kind of lost, but all music is sometimes uh, allmusic.com. Bruce Gertz. Let's see. Uh, all music. Bruce Gertz. You see Mingus over there? He just rang the bell. Oh, let me see. Oh, yeah. Big dog. That's a big standard poodle. <laughs> Hi, Mingus. Hi, Mingus. Hey, Mingus. So he rings the bell when he wants to go yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. That's um. His bell is is um. Right there on the wall. Um, that's funny. Can you? I don't know if you can see them. That doesn't matter. Yeah. Did you ever see Breaking Bad? Yeah, sure. You know the Breaking Bad. Do you remember Hector? Oh uh, no, I must have missed that part. <laughs> well, he ends up he ends up in a wheelchair. Oh yeah. And uh, he he can't speak and what's his name there is trying to poison the the uh, the guy with uh, something and <laughs> it's so the, and the other guys his I think his uncle or his father or something Hector and Hector just keeps ringing the bell like don't eat it don't eat it. <laughs> Anyway, we when when Mingus rings the bell, a lot of times we 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 think of Hector. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Hey, you know who's here? Who actually was in my band when I was at Berkeley? Mike Hatfield. Oh my God! I remember Mike. <laughs> I, I played with him years ago. I mean, decades ago. Yeah. I know. He says. Quiet bass solo, suitable background for a Sunday morning mimosa in Harvard Square Cafe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that. Mike, I, Mike, I've been thinking of you. I want to interview you, okay? <laughs> his, um, his brother just moved to Florida. I know. I interviewed yep. him and I was I said, oh, I got to, I got, we got to hang out in Boston. And he said, well, I'm in Florida now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I played with him quite a bit when he was up here. Yeah. He and Gay, we, we did some gigs at this Italian place. It's really fun. Uh -huh. In Newburyport. Newburyport. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, ma'am. Um, let's see. So, um, so I know you get up in the morning and you go to your piano and you do some composing. Is this, mm -hmm. is this like a, every morning? Yep. Yeah, I get a cup of coffee and I go over there. Yeah. I don't always get, you know, a song. So a lot of times I just get like a little short idea, but I'll, I'll write yeah. it down and then, you know, maybe go through some of my older tunes, whatever. Not yeah. that old, just the ones I've recently worked on. Yeah. 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 I find that, that as time goes on, I tend to have certain harmonic uh tastes that i lean towards and then i outgrow them or something and i move into a different air i don't outgrow it but i change yeah Start I know what you mean. Enjoying, yeah yeah certain qualities so i think i think that's a normal artist uh thing that happens like uh you know I, my first husband was a uh an artist uh that paint yeah painter yeah he well he painted he also put together you can't see it but there's like a mirror that he built you know oh, uh, quite a large mirror and he was he was a self-taught artist but he would get into these periods of time like a week to two weeks and he would create this one particular kind of thing and then 
and then that was it. And then he moved on. And mm -hmm. so I think in that, in the visual arts, it's possibly more obvious. But yeah, I also when in my composing, I seem to compose in a certain kind of genre or something. And then mm -hmm. that and then that's it. Then I move on to the next. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've been I, I, yeah. Can relate to that. I've been waiting for the muse to hit again for my writing. I, I mean, I think the piano classes are kind of stirring up some stuff. Um, and I, you know, I mean, I like to sit down and just, you know, put myself, what do you, what do you think? Like when you're into writing, do you, I mean, obviously for yourself, do you suggest it to students? Like just sit down um, and fool around and then, See, absolutely. You know, we do it all the time. Yeah, you know, sometimes I just go to the bass and I'll just play a note, just one note, and then I'll play another note, and uh, mm -hmm. that'll be the beginning of something right there. <laughs> that simple. Yeah. That's a lot of patience, man. You're a patience, patient person, aren't you? Yes, very much. Yeah. Yeah, I think you have to be if you're going to teach. You know, but that's not why I am. I just, I've always been that way. Yeah. Yeah, my parents that's... thought that when I was, even when I was a kid, I never, I was, you know, kids are always impatient, you know. <laughs> I know. We are, man. We really are. Um, by the way, Louise yeah. Koopman is oh. here and she's, oh. oh, it's Bruce Gertz. Oh, my God. Glad I stumbled in. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Louise. <laughs> <laughs> we've done some things go. together yeah that's cool yeah i met her through rebecca paris oh yeah that's cool i was just yeah. talking about rebecca yesterday why was i talking about her um oh i know i was hanging out with um i'm sure you know matt gordy oh yeah matt yeah we play he and i played with rebecca together too yeah Yep, we were just talking last night. After my gig, I stopped by a gig that a few of my guys were playing at, and, and Matt was hanging out, so we hung out. and We had chicken wings. We talked, <laughs> nice. we talked about Boston, and we talked about Marla and um, uh, yeah. Rebecca's uh, Paul, her, her uh, yeah, husband. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm in touch with Marla, actually. She's... She's helping me on the scholars thing, you know. Cool. Yeah. She's she's such a great person. Oh, she's fantastic. Yeah. 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 You know, Rebecca and I were. Um, she was a year older than me, and she, I went to Newton South. She went to Newton North, and um, but when we were in high school, junior high, I think junior high and high school, we were both in. Um, these uh, singing groups that were, yeah. one was yeah. like, a, what was the one? There was one, it was um, kind of a broad spectrum of singers, but the other one was the Greater Bostonians, which was run by two arrangers, professional arrangers, and it was like kind of a hand-picked group of people from various schools in Newton mm -hmm. with good arrangements and stuff. And oh, um, so good. she and I were both in in those together. That was when her name was Ruth McCluskey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So we were friends for years. Mm -hmm. She was a great, great singer. Great yeah. person. I only met her when she was Rebecca, but <laughs> my I I don't think I was married yet and didn't have the kids or anything. Yeah. So she saw them my kids grow up, you know. We became good friends with she became good friends with our family. She was cool. She was yeah. one of a kind. Yeah, definitely great singer. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, like I said, you have when I what in the beginning I said um, you have such a rich background, uh, and mm -hmm. um, you've just been so um consistent 
uh, consistently creative and uh, every time I ever heard about you or saw you, you were playing with great players and you were on the next project and you were always just right there. So I, I just uh, I want to acknowledge you for that. I'm sure I'm not the only one to acknowledge you for that. You must have received awards and stuff. Well, thanks. It's funny perspectives are different, you know, outside your own house, outside your home and <laughs> other people's perspectives, you know. <laughs> like yeah. people say to me, man, how do you find time to do this? How do you find time to do that? <laughs> I mean, I I can tell you that I waste plenty of time. You do? <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't, you know, what what's amazing to me is that, <laughs> you know, there is a lot of time. You know, you think, okay, life's short and time goes by really fast. And it does. But at the same time, if you do get in the moment, you know, the more you get in the moment, the longer time takes. <laughs> and uh, and, th and then you have time to do a lot of things in that set in, in that setting. Uh, like I, I could sit down and I could write like 50 bass lines in about an hour, you know, because I mean, I've just done this for so long now, 50 some odd years. So and then I could just put a book out 50 bass, you know, just like that, you know, uh, of course, it would all be written by hand because I don't I'm not as fast with my finale chops, you know, uh, but uh, you know, I just, I don't do that, even though I could I just, I feel like I want to just follow whatever inspiration comes to me. In you know, moment. so if I, yeah, like if I, I hear an idea or I look at a bass, hang, I have basses hanging on my walls. I got six upright basses. I got bass guitars all over the house. You know, I can go pick up an instrument in any room and just, and play some stuff and, and, you know, Sometimes they call me, you know, I go see one and it calls me, come play with, with me and I, I'll take it over to the TV or something. I'll put it on, I hear something on the TV and I'll just play along with it, you know, stuff like that. So I, I just like to be in the music as much as I can, you know. I also, though, since we've had Mingus, he's 11 and a half years old, spend a lot of time with him outside and, and just taking in a lot more nature which, you know, for so many years, I, I love it, but I didn't really pay that much attention. I was so busy doing, you know, the gig and the rehearsal and the teaching and the blah, blah, everything, you know, it's just constant, you know, in a way, I'm happy that I'm not doing six nights a week anymore that used to do years ago. You know, of course, those gigs were good training ground, really good training ground. In fact, I, you know, I did the Winokers. I played with them for like three years six nights a week and Sunday brunches. Really? Oh my yeah, God. Yeah, I, I learned so much on that gig, like so many tunes, because like, the first two hours was piano trio and we had a lot of good piano players on that. Um, and we would do some either Bill Evans or Wynton Kelly or Red Garland stuff. And, you know, and then the, the horns would come in and we'd just play swing music for the rest of the night. And I'd learn all that music and they had a book that was like a phone book and, you know, so thick, yeah. <laughs> two phone books, actually, you know, because you'd open it up and, it, you know, and uh, <laughs> eventually I got so sick of looking up the numbers because it was like four or five hundred numbers, you know, that I just <laughs> memorized everything, you know, <laughs> and yeah. uh, and then it was just like fun. Just go in there and just swing all night. And, yeah. You know, first two but those opportunities aren't there for the students, you know, to have, I know, I have, always say that. I know they don't have an opportunity for that, which is, that's really where I got a lot of, uh, experience, you know, with you different really have to make it happen now. It's, it's, it's very challenging. I think it, I'm, it certainly is. Uh, I feel bad for the people coming up. I mean, I'm always trying to give them ideas on how to get, you know how to get experience but i mean yeah. we were so lucky we had all kinds of music that we had to play we played at least every day yeah. if not twice a day you know oh yeah and, uh, i can remember having yeah. a triple on a sunday you know <laughs> yeah exactly exactly yeah yeah it's really it's it's a different time yeah what's, and what's, now, what do you think? Yeah. go ahead oh i was going to say and now with with technology, it would be a lot easier to do three gigs and 
and find them all. <laughs> I remember like, you know, pay phones and stuff and like not being able to find the gig and you'd have to find a phone to call the place. <laughs> so you'd have to go miles out of your way just to find the phone, a pay phone. <laughs> That's funny. You know, now you've got, now you've got a map on your phone, you can put the place in and it can direct you to it. And you can call the person if you're, That's you know, so true. What, yeah, I mean, I know. Things, you couldn't ever do it. But now the gigs aren't there. <laughs> but, but all the convenience of yeah. getting there is. You, it's really difficult. And it's cre that's part been part of my thing over the years is that I've created gigs. Um, and I just always was like that. I don't know why, maybe from my dad or I don't, I don't know. Yeah. But and I always felt like I'm not going to let some club owner decide if I'm going to sing just because he's an asshole or something and, sa and says no to me that I can't play there. So what? I'll just no. create, create it somewhere else. And then, you know, there was a period of time when um, the gigs that I was doing were very, you know, low paying and stuff. And, and some players didn't want to play those gigs. And, and I just thought, fine, I'll just find somebody else who does. And sure enough, there were people who just, you know, yeah, yeah. I'll play. And yeah. um, so it, there, that's no excuse, you know, and <clears throat> so I try and get my students to understand that, you know, okay, you want to play out, just go to a Starbucks and convince them that you want to play on a Sunday yeah. afternoon or whatever, you right. know, and then find the players who will play, you know. Exactly. Sure. Do it. If, you know, I have all my own music that I, I have to get my own gigs to do those you know yeah. you know i'm i'm very lucky that that marla called me because you know i don't have a lot of people a lot of clubs calling me up or agents or anything of course i i could hire an agent <laughs> but um i've done it all myself you know yeah and, uh, it's a it can be a lot of work logistic work you know definitely you know when i had my the, the group with 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 abercrombie and and Jerry Bergonzi, Joey Calderazzo, and Nussbaum, like I'd have to arrange hotels. I'd have to, you know, possibly rent a hall. I mean, all these things, you know. Uh, well, actually, I could. it was easier to get gigs with those names anyway, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But it was still a logistic uh, situation, you know, getting them up yeah. here and, and wanting to rehearse. It would be hard to do that, you know, so. I remember, uh, do you remember, did you ever know Jeff Richmond, the guitar player? Yeah, sure. Yeah. He, the, for a long time, um, he's a he's a really good friend of mine, and we went to college together. And he's a nice he lives man. Close, yeah. <clears throat> he was so prolific. He was, in fact, he was the kind of guy who would call up, Wayne Shorter and say, hi, I'm a guitar player. I want to come over and play with you. He was, he did that all the time. He, he had, uh, was fortunate enough to have these, these guys hire him to do these recordings with all these different players. So he would get all kinds of great players to like do yeah. each song, you know, and, but he never, he never took, any kind of attitude like you can't do this yeah he was always like yeah just you know just reach out and call and do it and that's yeah. a great attitude to have you know because you know yeah. then you end up with 20 records and nine right. books and, you know yeah you have it, to yeah you have to go for it you know was there was there ever any anybody's advice that you took that was like very substantial along the the this line uh along the line of getting gigs or <laughs> or continuing on or you know what you well, had you know, to do to be a professional my my bass teacher John Nevs he was just fantastic he told me he he said two things well, he said a lot more than two, but two that stuck with me a lot. And uh, one of them was take your time, you know, yeah. you know what I mean? So that you, you, he was referring to the playing at the moment, but it, it really makes, it goes into everything. So, uh, 
He said, take your time. And the other thing was to keep doing my own thing. Because, you know, when you're a bass player, you are a side man 95, 99.9% .9 of the time. Yeah. And, and I am. I mean, I have, I can just not do any of my own gigs and I can do plenty of gigs just playing bass with other people. Yeah. That's, that's easy to do. But I, being a writer and all that and then, you know, wanting to do my own music is, is the reason I pursue that. Yeah. Uh, so he, he told me to keep, you know, don't stop doing your own thing. Keep doing that. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Those, yeah. those are two great pieces of advice. Absolutely. And, um, actually, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about this for a second. Sure. I actually wrote, this took me uh, 15 years. <laughs> oh. I wrote a 52 page book in 15 oh. years, but uh, oh. it's just coming out now and I'm going to, it's, it's listed on Amazon, but it hasn't been, it's not really like available yet. In, in the, the next act record. of recording. Be oh, re oh, becoming. Oh, wow. Becoming. The act of becoming. Wow. Yeah, and this is just, uh, it's a little book, you can stick it in your pocket, but <clears throat> this actually is about, it's philosophy about how the same lesson in life can apply to other areas of your life. Like for me, voice technique and mm -hmm. for singing jazz, and the exact same, the exact same lesson is applicable everywhere. So. And I always thought we're so lucky to have the availability of music for our lessons. You know, I mean, we are so lucky to have that. We learn a lesson and it's a lesson. It's a life lesson, you know. So, um, yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah. The act of becoming. So it's, it's already on Amazon, you said? Yeah, well, it's, uh, I don't know if it's actually, I just went on like yesterday or the day before. The, it's just in its beginning stages. But okay. yeah, if you, even if you go and click on it, it'd be great because then Amazon goes, oh, there's, there's some interest in this book. So let's keep it on, mm -hmm. <clears throat> on the Amazon shelf, which is cool. Um, yeah, yeah. And I even, I even, I should send these to you, man. I even made these little stickers with positive sayings from, oh. These these hangs, which Bruce Gertz is the 400th guest today. And wow. these are like, you know, That's stuff me. like art is the tie that unites the planet. It only takes one human, you know, things like that. That's and um, so, yeah, um, in fact, I'm now that I finished that book, I kept saying, which I really want to do, I just uh, it's going to take time. So that's just another thing that I actually have to put time aside. I want to re-listen to these uh, sessions and take my my personal aha moments and write them down and put them into a book. But it's Great. you can imagine how long that's going to take. I guess I just have to start. Yeah, I'm number 400. That's going to take you quite a while. Somebody so. told me that I could go through it faster uh, in a certain way. I can't quite remember. I'm going to have to review notes hmm. and stuff. But anyway, um, That's oh, interesting. Thank, thank you, Michael Jenkins. He actually posted where my book is. Oh, How cool. Sweet. Thank cool. you very much. Um, it's very nice of you, Michael. Yeah. Um, so anyway, it is two hours. Oh, it is. Which is oh, can amazing. I can I just um, plug play something myself? Yeah, absolutely. I might even play that that waltz of yours. Oh, yes. Your it's called Song for Crumbles. But before yeah, you do I that, like I just that. want to say myself and a guy named Raleigh Green, we, we just put out a book. It's an Apple book and it's an app called Music oh. Sight Reader. And it's oh. musicsightreader.com. And it's um, classical duos trios and quartets and the music scrolls across the screen you have five different tempo selections you can have a click or not you can mute any track you want and you can it's a reading uh book for for practicing sight reading and it's wow. fantastic 
musicsightreader.com. If they go to the site, they'll see, I think my friend Raleigh actually does a demo with his guitar. So we have bass, guitar, and piano. Uh, and eventually it'll be for other instruments as well. But right now it's just Bach, Brahms, Mozart, and Mendelssohn. It's all oh. classical stuff. Yeah. And the wow. Bach stuff is, you know, it's all great. It's great music, you know, for, for practicing. Like, you know. Fantastic. Going out. Yeah, it's fantastic. And the other plug I want to make is that Tomorrow night, I'm playing at the Lily Pad in Cambridge, which is the same club. The very first thing you played was was recorded. So, where's the, where is the Lily Pad? It's, it's, right it's, in where, it's, it's right where the next door to where the 1369 Jazz Club used to be on oh. Cambridge Street. It's 1359. Oh, oh cool. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. yeah. And I've got a so good what? band, Phil Grenadier. Huh? Go ahead, Phil Grenadier. Oh, I was going to say, I've got Phil Grenadier, um, a great guitar player named Tim Miller, a tenor player named Rick DiMuzio, excellent player, and Mike Connors, who's a very excellent drummer. Yeah. So it's going to be a quintet. And I'll be playing so some cool. new tunes. Okay. Yeah. It's good to know you're playing. And that. so when I come to Boston, I'm going to, I definitely want to hear some music. <clears throat> I either want to come hear you or I want to go out with you and hear some good music, okay? Sure thing. Yeah. Just be prepared, man. <laughs> I will. I will. Keep in touch with me, you know. <laughs> I will. Thank you so much. Um, this was really fun. Tomorrow I'm having a, another bass player who is wonderful on this coast, Marlon Martinez. Wonderful bass player. On the young side, he has a big band that's really... Uh, oh, very oh. nice writing and um, yeah so him and then Wednesday uh, no relation but Misha Siegel who's uh, oh. from Israel and um, a pianist he, right yes he's a pianist and a composer yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've seen him and heard him because a friend of mine one of my colleagues at Berkeley Fernando Wergo played bass with him oh yeah interesting Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks, Michael. Michael also posted uh, your music site reader on here. Oh, nice. Nice, thanks, Michael. Very helpful. Great. Yeah. Great. Um, just quickly before I play your last song, because I want to play your last song. Okay. Uh, Thursday through Sunday, I have um, I have uh, archives. So Thursday is Tanya Grubbs. Do you know her? I don't think Great so. Great singer from Pit uh, from. She's in Pittsburgh. She's really, a, really a good singer. Then Amy Nolte, who's kind of a online hit. She's a pianist, teacher, singer, um, who a lot of people all over the world know mm. because of her Facebook stuff. And then um, I, I know you know these people on Saturday, Judy Silvano and Joe Lovano. Of course. That's from the I know them well. And I know you know these people, too. Sunday is Cindy Scott and Brian Seeger. Yep. And then, just so you know, guys, Sunday I will be on Jocelyn Medina's show. Uh, let's see. East Coast is 6 to, let's see, 6 to 8.30. It, Jocelyn is a singer. She was, started this in New York a, a number of years ago. She will present a singer like me for the first set, and then there will be a jam. And it's, it's, all, it's online now. Wow. So, the first set I will be singing with my one of my favorite piano players, Gary Fukushima here. And uh, so we'll do it like your time, six o'clock. And um, yeah, so and then now we're going to play one last song uh, from Bruce's current record. And it is the song for Crumbles, right? Yeah, yeah. This is it's it's written for John Abercrombie and it features Vic Juris. Great, okay. And they're probably jamming right now in heaven. <laughs> probably. Gorgeous.
Beautiful. That is really Thank nice. You. Thank you. I think everybody put their heart into that one. Yeah. It's very beautiful. Thank you very much. It's really been nice having you on, Bruce. And oh, it's been fun to be on, and I, I really enjoyed speaking with you, and it's uh, nice to hear about the things that you're doing, too. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to pick up your book. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, Thanks so, so much. Uh, yeah, it was, really, it was really nice and uh, very comfortable conversation and enlightening. And, um, yeah, I look forward to hanging out with you. In yeah, stay in touch. Okay. Let me know when you're in town. All right, I will. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you for being here. See you tomorrow with yet another bass player. But <laughs> it will be 401 instead of wow. 400. Yes. Wow. Thank you for being the 400th. My pleasure. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Okay. Bye, Bruce.